we have Eric Billingsley. Hello. Hi. So you are a indie developer based in Ottawa, Canada, fellow Canadian, who's always loved making games and started as a kid with tools like Click and Play. Since en entering the industry, Eric's worked on titles like Tunic and Cuphead and released his own commercial titles, Spring Falls and Star Twine. He also helps run monthly show and tell meetups with local group Dirty Rectangles. And lately he's been making small games for the Pico 8, including the roguelike Into Ruins, which I believe you're going to talk about now. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, so hi, welcome to my talk. Uh, uh, this is a uh, scope down design, uh, making a tiny roguelike. Um, so hi, hello. Uh, my name is Eric Billingsley. Um, I release games under the name Sparse Game Dev, which is kind of a weird name, I know. Um, I've been working in the games industry since 2009, uh, though I started making games as a kid, like Alexi mentioned. Uh, when I first got into the industry, um, I was working in on some AAA stuff. Um, and I've worked on some bigger indie titles, and I've also released a, co a couple of my own uh, commercial games. Um, so none of these games are roguelikes. So what, what am I talking about here? Um, this talk is about a different game uh, called Into Ruins, which is a roguelike. Um, and it's also going to be about uh, how much I love the game Brogue. Uh, and it's also going to be about some basic strategies for simplifying a game's design. Um, and how they can lead to interesting choices and how I think they did in the case of this game. Um, some disclaimers, I'm gonna be comparing my game to Brogue a lot, um, but I don't think my game is better than Brogue. Uh, Brogue is a masterpiece and one of my favorite games of all time. Um, and also this is mostly a design focused talk, uh, but there's gonna be just a little bit of technical stuff, um, mostly going over uh, the limitations of the Pico 8 platform because that had a big impact on uh, what the game became and the design of it. <clears throat> um, so what is Into Ruins? What is it? Um, Into Ruins is a traditional roguelike for the Pico 8 fantasy console. Um, it's also my first roguelike and my first uh, Pico 8 game, so I was kind of diving into the deep end a bit with this one. Uh -huh. And the, the goal of the game is to get to depth 16 and retrieve the wings of Yendor. So pretty standard roguelike stuff. Um, it has hex grids, as you can see from the GIF there. Um, I like hex grids, they're cool. Um, and it also has isometric, I, I say isometric, I guess it's nearly isometric, Not maybe that's not technically right. Uh, pixel art, uh, it's animated. Um, so from a presentation perspective, that's, that's what the game is. Um, what is Pico 8? Uh, Pico 8 is a fantasy console um, inspired by older 8-bit systems. So it's not like a real system or device that existed. It's a program that you run, and you can load cartridges, uh, like virtual cartridges that were made by people, and play games um, and other, other things. Um, it was created by Joseph White, also known as Zep. And it has everything you need built in to make games with it. So it has like a... It has a code editor, and it also has a sprite editor, and it has a tracker for making uh, music and sounds. Um, and all, all of this is very cute and fun to work with. <laughs> it also has uh, built-in tools, or a built-in built tool called Splore, uh, which you can use to explore things other people have made um, and like see featured games and that kind of thing, which is really cool. Um, it has a really nice community. Um, and it has a lot of technical restrictions that give games a common feel. So you, you open up a Pico 8 game, and it feels like a Pico 8 game. Uh, so what are those restrictions? Um, it has a really small resolution, so everything looks really chunky. Um, it has a very limited sprite sheet as well. So uh, what you see to the right, that's all of the art in my game. Um, you can only use 16 colors, um, and there are four channels of audio that you can set to different waveforms to make sounds and music. Um, it also has limited memory and CPU usage, which is kind of neat because uh, it means that the games run the same on different devices. And it also means that they can run on some pretty low end devices, which is cool. Uh, and there's a limit on the size that your code can be. <laughs> so this is, this is like the big restriction because 
Um, if you're talking about a sprite sheet, you look at you look at your sprites and you say, okay, I I want to use dedicate a quarter of this sprite sheet to my enemies, and each one is eight by eight and it has four frames of animation. That means I can have 16 enemies, and it's really easy to like. Well, I say easy, but it's easier at least to to reason about that and plan that out. It's a lot harder to look at your enemy enemies and say, I think it's going to take this many lines of code to implement pathing or some other system that your game needs. So um, the, the code size thing is is tricky. It's it's kind of like solving a puzzle as you make your game. Um, I found that like halfway through development, anytime I wanted to add something new, I had to go in and rework what I already had in order to make it fit, uh, which can be frustrating, but it's also satisfying. And uh, the upside to all these restrictions are that the games are really small. And uh, one cool thing about Pico 8 is the games can be encoded into the low entropy bits of an image of the cartridge. Uh, so uh, this picture here of the cartridge is the game. Uh, Pico 8 can open up that image and run it, um, which is neat. Uh, it's, that's not quite true. My game is actually two cartridges, but it's the same idea. Um, I wanted to mention some other games before I get going with the talk. Uh, Pork Leg by Christian Majewski and uh, Curse, uh, Curse of the Lich King by Johan Pates. Uh, so these are both roguelikes for the Pico 8. Uh, they also have kind of a simplified design and they're excellent games. Um, and these are kind of the two games I looked at and was like, okay, I think what, what I'm trying to do is possible on the Pico 8. Um, and Pork Leg, uh, Christian actually has a entire YouTube series that's a tutorial on how to make this game. So if you want to get into uh, roguelike development on the Pico 8. That's a really great place to start. Uh, so check that out. Um, I also wanted to mention Pixel Dungeon uh, by Oleg Dolia, which is uh, another uh, roguelike that is based heavily on Brogue. Um, so a lot of people uh, who play my game will say, this is a lot like Pixel Dungeon. And I think that's because they both have kind of a common ancestor. But Pixel Dungeon, uh, it's on PC and mobile. Uh, it has cool pixel art. It's also a very excellent game. Um, and then, of course, uh, Brogue. Brogue is, was the biggest influence uh, for me on this project, uh, created by Brian Walker, who has actually done a couple of different talks at this conference before. Um, I'll have links to those at the end of the talk. Um, and so what is it that, that makes Brogue uh, special? Uh, so Brogue is sort of a modern reimagining of the original Rogue. You can see it has kind of like these single screen dungeons like the original Rogue did. Uh, there's no classes. <clears throat> so um, it has this really cool system where uh, you, the way you, you build your character is you kind of find random equipment. And then you also find these scrolls of enchantment. And when you, when you use those, you apply them to one of your pieces of equipment and power it up. So it's like as you're going, you, you pick which pieces of equipment you want to want to keep and you choose which ones to invest uh, this resource into, and you build your character that way. And uh, that's really flexible. It's like you're building a class as you go. And it also means that there's like a lot of variety from run to run in how it plays out, which is cool. Um, it also has a lot of different unique monster abilities. Um, so there's not that many monsters in the game, but uh, they all have something kind of special about them, which is which is neat because it's it means that uh, there's a lot of variety, but also that there's not as much to learn. Like once you've played the game enough times, you you sort of you're familiar with the different monsters and you know what to expect uh, for the most part, which is cool. Um, it also has a lot of transparency, so it tells you a lot about what the monsters can do, what your equipment can do, what, what the stats are, and all that. And so you don't need to look it up in an external source or anything like that. Um, and then it also has this concept of machine rooms, which is, I think, core to Brogue, but not something I even attempted to put into my game uh, because it, I knew it would just would take too much code. <laughs> um, but the machine rooms are basically uh, puzzles that are integrated into the dungeon levels. And when you solve them, it opens up a room. And uh, there's in the room, there's a bunch of different pieces of equipment, but you're only allowed to take one of them. So this is another way that the game kind of gives you flexibility in designing your character builds. It also has like really organic feeling and pretty level generation. Like I, this cave system on the right looks really cool with this big open pit and the water. Um, and it has a lot of interactions with the environment. So things can catch on fire. There's gases that can kind of spread out um, and there's traps. 
Um, so all of this makes for really dynamic gameplay and, and like a lot of tactics, which is a lot of fun. Like positioning is really important and kind of looking at what's around you and, and uh, choosing a course of action based on that. <clears throat> and I think it's just a generally a beautiful, well-designed game. Um, so it was natural for me uh, making my first roguelike with no experience, making something in the genre to kind of look to my favorite game in the genre for inspiration. And I so I sort of like used this game as a sort of a reference point when I was making my game. Um, but I also wanted to do something unique. I didn't want to just make Brogue again. So, and I, I knew that because I was working on the Pico 8 and also because I wanted to finish this game in a reasonable amount of time, I would need to simplify uh, my design quite a, quite a bit. So how, how do you do that? How do you take a design and make it simpler? Um, so you're thinking of adding another system to your game. Uh, ask yourself, do I really need the system? Uh, even if it's like a given for the genre that you're working in, ask the question, maybe especially if it is, because uh, I think there's a lot of things where we just kind of assume that we need them. We don't even think about it. Uh, we say this is this type of game. It means it needs this. And we don't examine the question. And, and maybe you do, but it, maybe you do need it, but maybe you don't. And it's nice to at least think about those questions. Maybe it'll lead you something, lead you somewhere uh, interesting. Um, ask yourself, does this add to the game? And even if it does add to the game, is it worth the time developing it? And this is a real question. Like we have limited time. Maybe you don't want to spend uh, two years working on your roguelike. You have to pick and choose uh, which systems you put in. Uh, ask yourself, even if it would add something, would it take away something as well? Like would it distract from the elements that are the core of your game? Is this part of the core of your game or not? And if it's not, maybe you don't need it. And maybe it's taking away attention from where you really want uh, the focus of the game to be. <clears throat> and would not having this give your game something unique? Would it add something different to your environments or have, uh, add some kind of unique gameplay thing that you haven't seen before? Or just you know, uh, add some something, maybe it's a piece of world building that comes out of this. Uh, all things to think about. Um, and would not having this thing, like think through if you didn't have this element, would that lead you to make other decisions in terms of design that are interesting? Maybe it would lead you to make some compromises that you're not happy with, but maybe it would open up some new possibilities that you wouldn't have thought of if you hadn't like taken this line of, of investigation. Uh, so here's some examples from Into Ruins. Uh, the first one is uh, my game doesn't have doors in it. Uh, doors are really hard. They affect lots of different systems. Like they affect your they affect field of view, they affect enemy AI and pathing. You have to think about like if I throw this item at the door, what happens? It's just really there's all these edge cases. Um, and if I was trying to make a simplified design, I didn't want to have to deal with those. So I decided to just not have doors. Um, my levels are pretty small anyway and I thought maybe having doors there would just make them feel even more claustrophobic. Um, so this kind of opens things up. Um, it kind of makes for more dynamic gameplay because it means that sort of enemies can spot you from other rooms. Uh, you can be engaged in combat and it'll kind of spill over from room to room. So it kind of, uh, it kind of makes each uh, floor of the dungeon feel sort of like one big arena, which is kind of what I was going for. Um, and also it fits well aesthetically with, with the look of the game because I'm going for these really old crumbled uh, dungeons uh, where like the walls are crumbling and there's holes everywhere and uh, the only thing remaining is stuff made of stone like the uh, the bricks and the statues that haven't rotted away. So I think that worked well for atmosphere as well. Um, here's another example, uh, character levels. Uh, Brogue actually already did this. Um, so. When Brogue launched, it did have a character level system. You would get XP as you killed monsters and you would get stronger. And then partway, or at a certain point, it was removed from the game, which I don't think you see that too often, like a, a patch just like stripping out a system from a game and, and making it stronger. So, so what does removing levels do um, for your game? Well, you, you do lose a bit of that feeling of your character like growing in power uh, as you kill monsters. Um, that's kind of a, a compromise there. Um, but in, in the case of, of, uh, of, in our case anyway, uh, we already have like another 
another way to progress your character, which is uh, in my game, they're the orbs of power. It's the equivalent of uh, the scrolls of enchantment and brogue. And so uh, <clears throat> if we remove the character leveling, it just puts more focus on this progression mechanic we already have. Uh, so it, it makes those decisions for what you power up uh, even more meaningful. And it also means that there's more variation uh, between the builds because they don't all scale in this common way. Uh, it also puts more focus on stealth play and allows you to run away from monsters. Um, so if you're in combat and it's getting particularly nasty, maybe you can run away and jump down a pit or something. Um, because the player isn't thinking about, you know, I, I really don't want to engage in this encounter, but if I don't, I, I'll miss out on XP and I'll be behind. Because they don't have to make that decision, it, it means that they have way more options. It means that more builds are viable. Um, and I think that's a good thing for the game. It also means that uh, I can kind of keep using my enemies longer from the early game. I can take those early game enemies and plop them on later levels, and they're still a challenge for the player, which is really helpful in my case because I can only have like 14 enemies. Um, so maybe if I can use goblins on the lower depths, but just maybe have bigger groups of goblins, um, that's a win. It's good. Uh, what are some other ways that we can simplify designs? Uh, so, so you're thinking of adding not one, but two different systems to your game. Uh, ask yourself, uh, can one of these systems do the job of the other one? And if it can, would that be easier to implement? Would it be easier for players to understand? Um, this often is true. If, if, if they're already familiar with something and they see it again in a different context, they can make that connection uh, of how it should work. Um, would, would this open up new gameplay, gameplay possibilities? Um, and if they can't quite be combined uh, with the way they're currently designed, can you change a little bit what your goals are or just kind of massage the way one of them works to make it mostly cover the basis of what the other one does. Think about like if you did that, uh, what would the consequences of that be? Um, and maybe that will, maybe that won't work out. But it's good to examine that, and maybe it will also lead you to some some different things, and maybe it'll affect a lot of things in your design. Uh, so here's a really basic example. Uh, these ones I'm going to be kind of comparing to Brogue a bit. So uh, Brogue has both, well, like a lot of Brogue likes, it has both potions and scrolls. Uh, potions are things that you can either drink and they have an effect on you, or you can throw them and they have an effect on the environment or on whatever you threw it at. Um, and scrolls are a thing that you can read them and they have a magical effect. And then once you read them, they're, they're, they're like a one use item. Um, so if you think about it, like drinking a, a potion and using a scroll is a very similar action. Uh, so I decided to combine these two concepts together into something I called orbs. <laughs> so um, all orbs can be used or thrown. So if you look at the, the animation on the right there, you can see um, the player finds a black orb and th throws it. And it turns out it's an orb of fire. And it sets uh, the enemy and the environment on fire. Um, if you were to use that instead, then the player would burst into flames and fire would spread around them. Um, but what does it actually mean to use an orb like diegetically? I think this is kind of an aside. I just think it's a, it's an interesting question. I initially wanted the verb to be to eat. I thought it'd be funny if you were if you were eating the orbs. Um, but when I thought about it a bit, it didn't really make sense that you would like consume something and then it would power up a piece of equipment or identify something. So I I decided to scrap that and just like leave it up to the imagination of the player. So what you're actually doing, uh, I, I'm not really sure. Maybe it depends on which orb. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Um, and so the other thing about combining these two categories is uh, because we have very few items, like I, I think I only have eight orbs in total in the game um, because I'm restricted in the number of sprites and the number of uh, behaviors I can have coded in. Um, combining these two categories makes the identification game more interesting because now we have eight differently colored things and we have to try them out. And it takes longer uh, to figure out which ones are which because if we had, uh, I think if, if we had like two categories with four each, it would be a lot easier to narrow that down. Maybe that's less interesting. Um, this is another 
example here of an orb where, so there's an orb of data, which normally you would use to uh, identify your equipment. But if I throw it at this goblin, we can see that the goblin is named Fluffy and you can also see the goblin stats. Uh, another example is uh, staves and wands. So in Brogue, Brogue has both of these concepts. The staves are basically like adding a spell to your character. You get it, and then you, it charges back over time, and you can use it to cast spells, and you can power it up with your orbs. Um, and then wands are more like you, you get them, and they have a limited charge. They don't, they don't recharge, and once they're out of charges, you would normally throw them away. You can power them up to get back some charges, but nor, they're not usually like a core part of your character build. Um, so I decided to combine these two concepts together into staves, but, but different. Um, so the staves in my game don't recharge on their own. Uh, they don't recharge over time. Um, but you can still charge them up with the orbs. So if you use an orb on it, it will fully recharge and also gain a charge. And you can also charge them with specialized equipment that you find. Um, there's an amulet of wisdom and a cloak of wisdom. And if you have those, then when you go down a level in the dungeon, it recharges your staves. Uh, so what, what this does is um, it means that depending on your build, you would use these items really differently. So if you're playing like a melee build, you would uh, probably just use all the charges and then throw it away. And if you were playing a magic build, you would be willing to invest uh, those orbs of power into the staves and, and keep recharging them. And if you happen to find the equipment that lets you recharge them as you go, then maybe you could have a bunch of different staves that all recharge at once um, and get a powerful build that way. Um, so there's a lot of different options um, that come from just this one category of item, which I think is really cool. Um, and now here's a more like system-based one. So uh, again, in, in Brogue, there's both light and stealth. So uh, there's on your dungeon levels, there's uh, areas that are brightly illuminated. There's areas that have like patches of darkness. And as you go down the dungeon, it gets gradually darker and darker. And there's also a stealth system where you have a stealth range. And uh, enemies that are within that stealth range have a chance to spot you each turn. Um, but it's a little bit hard to reason about what that stealth range is as you move around the dungeon, because it's it's calculated based on uh, the the how, how much light is in the tile you're in, which is not always easy to tell, and also based on the last action you took. So there's like a, there's a thing you could turn on that adds an overlay, um, which shows you the stealth range, which helps a little bit. But I wanted to go in a different direction with this. So I asked the question, like, what if light and stealth are the same? Um, instead of having a separate stealth range, what if I just use light to determine visibility? Um, so this means the enemy is seen almost the same way the player does. Um, so I think that's a little easier to reason about. Um, if you're if you're standing in the light, then they have a chance to spot you, um, and um, that also means they can kind of see you from across the map, which is a little interesting. Um, and it also affected sort of the way that I designed my stealth system because, well, now instead of having an item like a cloak of stealth that makes it harder for enemies to spot you, I have items which allow you to see further into the darkness. Um, so what this does is it, uh, it, first of all, gives you more map awareness in general. But the big thing it does is it allows you to play more effectively in the dark. Um, so now you can, uh, like instead of using the items that give you light, you can not use those. You can stay in the dark more often and play stealthy that way. You can throw items at torches to knock them over. Uh, so you don't have to go into the light. And you can sneak by enemies. Um, there's all these different options that open up. Um, and I think uh, the result of this maybe is that uh, stealth is a little bit overpowered in the game. Um, but the interesting thing is you can tweak this really easily just by having more things cast light. Um, like you could have an enemy that carries a torch around. Um, and I have it so that uh, when you cast certain or use certain uh, staves, uh, it eliminates your character for a turn and enemies can spot you and that kind of thing. So um, it's really dependent on on the light and that that makes it I think pretty dynamic and, and intuitive for the player as well. Um, and this is the big one. <laughs> so, um, so stairs and holes, this might seem kind of silly, um, but 
uh, this was like a, a big thing for the game. Um, so again, in Brogue, there's a, so it has stairs like a normal roguelike. You can go to the stairs and go down to the lower level. And that's the normal way that you get around the dungeon and progress. Um, but it also has these big open chasms that you can choose to, to uh, jump down if you want. Um, in Brogue, these, these hurt you quite a lot. Um, and so you normally only do it when you're desperate. Um, but I wanted to ask the question, uh, what if this was the only way to progress? Like, do we really need stairs? Um, and, and this was a really big deal. Um, so uh, this led to like all of these different cascading design decisions. Um, so if we don't have stairs and you have to jump down these pits, uh, I, I didn't want you to always be hurting the player uh, anytime they're going down a level that felt really mean. So I added an item called the Orb of Gravity. Um, when you use the Orb of Gravity, it gives you a slow fall uh, status, which ticks down. And as long as you have that running, you can safely descend without hurting yourself. Um, so if you think about it, what that really does, it, it acts like, uh, like, the hun like the hunger meter uh, in, in another roguelike. It's sort of a replacement for the hunger meter because it adds this pressure to keep going. Um, you have to make progress. You have to get down the hole before it runs out, and you have to find more of these things so that you don't end up hurting yourself. So I think that's really interesting. It's not super obvious that it does that, but I think it does. Um, the other thing about this is it means now you can't go back up. Um, it sounds simple, but it has a lot of effects on, on the gameplay. Um, it affects uh, the way that I design the items. It affects inventory management, because now you can't just leave something behind and return to it later. You have to decide what items you want to bring with you before you jump down. Um, so certain items, like, a, like a, the Wisdom Cloak I mentioned earlier, um, and also I did this for basically all of the passive effects in the game, they don't just happen over time. They only happen uh, when you jump down. And I wouldn't be able to do this if you could go back up again, because then you could just go up and down and, and keep activating the item. Um, so the big thing that this does is it means that uh, because it only activates when you go down, there's no incentive to just wait around for your stuff to recharge. Um, you always have to make progress in order to, for things to happen, uh, which I think really uh, strengthened uh, the design of the game and the way these items worked. It also affects levels generation because now we, we need to have these holes on every floor, and we know that the player is always going to be on the lookout for them. Um, and so it kind of affects the aesthetics of the levels. It also, um, I'm actually generating the next depth differently depending on which hole you jump down. We don't need to get into that too much, uh, but it's sort of interesting um, just to make it feel more like a cohesive dungeon. Um, and it also got integrated into uh, the story of the game. So the game opens up with uh, the player looking into this uh, open chasm, this cave, and feeling like a call from it, and feeling like they, they need to go down and explore. Um, and it also, the, the item you're looking for, uh, the Wings of Yendor, is a method of escape, because it's you don't have a way to go up otherwise. Um, so cutting stairs from the game really, for me, I made this decision early on, and it really defined what the game became. Um, it would be a completely different game if I had stairs in it. And I think it's really interesting that just cutting one feature can can lead you to all these different places um, and and affect like the design so much and and even not just like the gameplay, but the themes uh, and everything. Um, so what are some takeaways? Uh, did I learn from, from this? Um, like I said, cutting or combining features often leads you to unexpected places. Uh, having fewer things forces you to really tune the systems you have and think about how they interact together. So when we're designing a roguelike, you always want to have different interacting systems. Um, that's what leads to sort of the unexpected, unexpected behavior. But if you have like a thousand different things in your game, you're probably not going to be thinking about all of the combinations, right? So you'll end up having some things that feel more separate from each other. I think uh, having fewer things forces you to really think about this. And what you end up with generally is a more kind of focused and cohesive design in the end. Um, and having fewer things can make games easier to learn and understand for players. Maybe this is obvious, I don't know. Um, but 
Restrictions can also be inspiring and fun to work with. I had a lot of fun uh, learning how to use Pico 8 and make games for it. Um, and there's a lot of other kind of projects that have similar restrictions. So if you want to play around with these things, I would recommend it. It's, re it's really fun. Um, and it leads you to, uh, to things you might not have thought of otherwise. Um, and simpler games are easier and faster to make. So you can move on with your life. Uh, like I said, we have, we have limited time. Um, maybe you don't want to spend tons of time working on your roguelike. Maybe you want to get to another project. Maybe you just want to have more free time and spend less time on this game. Um, if you make your game simpler, it will be faster to make, probably. <laughs> and uh, simple games are beautiful. Uh, this is this is a subjective thing, obviously, but I think if you can kind of achieve that that roguelike magic of having interacting to systems which cause like unexpected things to happen and put you in situations you didn't realize were possible. Um, if you can do that with fewer elements, it's just all the more striking, I think. Um, so that, that's all I've got. Uh, here are some links. You can follow me on Mastodon or visit my website. Um, I did a write-up on the level generation in the game and also how I kind of crammed it into a Pico 8 cartridge. Um, so you can check that out on the Lex Lawful forums. Uh, you should go play Brogue if you haven't. It's a really excellent game. Um, and you should check out uh, Brian's talks at previous roguelike celebrations um, and try out Pico 8. Thanks. That was wonderful, Eric. And it's also, it's very uh, kind of you to be telling people to go play Brogue. I think also, go play Eric's game. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> it's thank beautiful. Um, so thank you very much.